for tuning in to the Majors and Quinn virtual events uh, on our YouTube page and Facebook channel. Um, we are so excited to be here tonight with another author, uh, Ted McClelland, for his book, Midnight in Vehicle City. Uh, General Motors, Flint, and the Strike that Created the Middle Class. And he's going to be discussing that book with Con uh, with Connor Coyne, who is also a writer and also is from Flint. So he has an insider's view here um, mm -hmm. of that city. And I just want to remind you that the book I'll be is right back. Oh. I just want to remind you that the book is available for purchase at majorsandquinn.com and we do have uh, copies that have book signed book plates in them so if you purchase it today or in the next couple of days you will get a signed copy um, thanks to Ted who has sent those over to us um, I would like to remind you that Majors and Quinn is an independent bookstore so uh, thank you very much for viewing this event and also thank you so much for tuning in and possibly uh, buying the book. We cannot do this kind of thing without your support, so thanks so much. Um, I am going to just do a brief introduction of our speaker. So Edward McClellan is a journalist, historian, and author, born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. His work has been published in numerous places, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Chicago Reader, and on Salon and Slate. He is the author of several books, including Young Mr. Obama, Chicago and the Making of a Black President, Nothing But Blue Skies, The Heyday, Hard Times, and Hopes of America's Industrial Heartland, and How to Speak Midwestern. Um, and you can find him online at edwardmcclellan.com. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. Thank you. I am very much looking forward to hearing your discussion, and I know you'll be taking questions later, so if anyone sure. would like to ask you questions, please do so in the comments. You can type a comment um, at any point during the broadcast, and we will take your questions at the end. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you so much, Annie, and uh, thank you, Ted, for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, Thanks, Connor, for participating. Well, we need a voice from Flint. I feel like... Uh, this is a pan Midwestern event. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this book. Um, there's been a ton of books, ton of articles and history uh, written about the great sit, Flint sit down strike. Mm -hmm. um, not so much like recently, the, the one that most people have heard of is Sidney Fine's book, sit down right. and that came out 50, 50 years ago. And uh, well, two years ago, two years ago in 69. Um, so uh, I think just to kind of like start things off, um, given how much has been written about this strike, uh, why did you think uh, the subject needed another book? Why did you want to write uh, write about this subject in particular? Well, you know, you 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 know, you mentioned a lot's been written, but not recently. And I I really don't think it's that well known of an incident outside Flint and outside Michigan. And, you know, Sidney Fine's book, you know, you said it was written in 1969. That was such a different moment in the history of Flint and and uh, the labor movement and the auto industry and the middle class. I mean, at that time, it looked like the gains of the of the sit down strikers were, you know, were permanent. And, you know, Flint was this you know prosperous city. Uh, you know, it had 200,000 people. And as, as I mentioned in the book, you know, as late as 1980, Flint had the highest wages for young workers in the United States. Uh, and of course, since then, you know, the number of workers who belong to unions has decreased from something like 30% to 6%. Um, obviously, you know, Flint is half the size it, it used to be. It, it's gone from 80,000 GM workers to 6,500 uh, GM workers. And, you know, we, we just don't have a, a middle class the way they do when when the, the auto industry and the unions were were in their heyday and, and also that you know the last sit down striker died a few years ago I, uh, one of the very one of the last was a family friend of ours a guy named Everett Ketchum he was 21 when he was in the sit down strike and he was 98 when he died in 2013 so he, he's a good advertisement for what uh, GM healthcare can do to uh uh, extend extend your life. So uh, you know, I, I I definitely you know felt uh, at a moment when we're wondering uh, about the fate of the middle class that uh, 
that this was a timely book. And, uh, uh, and, I, and maybe this is one of the questions you're going to talk about in the future. But I mean, I think it's also a timely book because, um, you know, we're hearing about this Amazon uh, um, organizing effort in Al Alabama. And it's just amazing how what they want is so similar to how what the sit down strikers wanted. Mm -hmm. you know, sit down strikers mm -hmm. wanted to slow down the speed up on the assembly line and uh, these workers in Alabama, they want to, um, uh, you know, th they say that their quotas are just inhuman, that, that, you know, they can't meet them and they want more job security and more say in, uh, in the workplace, which is what the sit down strikers wanted. And, you know, as they say, it wasn't about money. It was about dignity. Mm hmm. I wonder, um, I, 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 this wasn't something I had asked you about before, but I'm wondering in light of that, could you, could you share a little bit about the specific objections to, you know, the, the work system that was in place at GM when the sit down strike happened? Why were conditions so bad that workers felt they had to take over a factory and shut it down uh, in order to empower the union? Well, I mean, you know, I mentioned the speed up, you know, they would just crank the lineup to an inhuman pace and workers would go home so exhausted they couldn't even lift a, a fork to their mouths. Uh, you know, they, they just, you know, collapse in front of their wives and children. I mean, there was no job security. And they said, they said, if your former one to hire his brother-in-law, he just gave you a pink slip and put his brother-in-law on the line. And, and, you know, you really, you really had to suck up to these guys. Uh, they said that workers who had, you know, farms hadn't in because they would bring the they would bring the foreman food and, you know, you had to, you had to, uh, you know, paint the foreman's house or throw him a party and look the other way if you got fresh with your wife. I mean, this was during the depression and people were so desperate uh, for jobs that they, they would do anything to stay employed. So, I mean, people really, uh, really felt like they had to abase themselves um, just to work at, at General Motors. I mean, then there was no health insurance. You know, I talked about a guy named Neil Yacklin who, uh, you know, he's half blind. He kind of put a, a, a rail in his eye and it took him a couple of years just to get compensation from the state of Michigan. You know, he didn't get it from his GM healthcare. Uh, so uh, these were, uh, th these were the, um, you know, and even without being in the middle class, I think that the sit down strikers won some victories that today we, a lot of workers uh, take for granted, even if the way, even if the wages aren't as good as they, as they used to be. And you kind of draw a one-to-one -one, um, analogy uh, in the epilogue between uh, the, the, the main technique of the sit-down, um, which just so everybody knows, it's uh, you don't vacate the premises, you, you right. stay there, you don't destroy the machines, you right. keep them, but it, it, it keeps the factory from bringing in scab workers. Right, exactly. Um, and this was think, a, oh, yeah. go ahead. I mean, it was a tactic that had been tried in, in, in Europe, I mean, previously. So this wasn't the first sit-down strike, but it was the most famous sit-down strike. And do you think that these same techniques would, would have the same currency today that they had in, in, in uh, 1936-37? Sure. I mean, if all the Amazon workers sat down, I mean, to tie up commerce for the whole country, especially now that you know, everybody's ordering things on the Internet because they don't, they don't want to go shopping during the pandemic, this this is the this is the perfect time for them to to go on strike. So, if any Amazon workers are watching this, uh, right. take note, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the way that this book was written because that was very uh, intriguing to me. Uh, even as somebody who you know has grown up in this community and has been hearing about the sit down strike and is automatically kind of interested in it. Um, a lot of the writing on it sometimes is a very dry, very archival, you know, um, and your book takes a very different approach. It is not quote academic, uh, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a couple hundred pages. It's infused with dialogue and description. Right. Um, and I know that, you know, I, I'd like to talk in a, in a few minutes about the research that you did for that, but um, just, um, just, just first, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit about uh, why you chose, uh, you know, more of a storytelling style for this book and what you hoped to accomplish with that. 
Uh, well, you know, I'm not an academic, so that's I didn't want to write. I wasn't going to write it. I had no motivation to write an academic book. Um, and I, I, I feel like labor labor history has kind of a, a dreary reputation. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I thought of this as you know, uh, an exciting, action packed story, and that's what I wanted to tell. And I wrote it in the present tense because I, I wanted to, I wanted it to feel immediate. I wanted it to feel like this is something it, you, it can happen now. I mean, it has, you know, conflict and violence and it has all these, it has larger than life characters like uh, Francis Perkins and, and John L. Lewis and, and Alfred P. Sloan. And it's got the voices of the, of the ordinary uh, workers on the line too. So I, I guess I wanted it to be an introduction to this kind of history. I, wa I wanted it to be uh, a story that someone, even someone without an interest in, uh, labor history could kind of could kind of grab onto. Yes, I love that about it. And personally, I, I felt that the 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 present tense was you know arresting and almost gave it kind of a cinematic quality. Like you feel yeah um, like you're a, a, a bystander to uh, to these events. Yeah, I've never written a book in present tense before or, or written much of anything, but for some reason it just it just felt like. It just felt like the right approach, so I, I sat down and and, and I, I went at it uh, that way. Maybe because it's so far away historically, and I wanted it to, you know, feel like it could be happening now. Yeah, this seems like uh, maybe an appropriate time to uh, have a have oh, a reading. Oh sure, all right. I'll read. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the most action packed uh, <laughs> part about the the battle of the running bulls. This chapter, the Battle of the Running Bulls, and they called it because you know the bulls. That's what they used to call the the police, and that they made the bulls, the workers made the bulls run. Okay, on January 11th, the heat inside Fisher Two goes off at noon. In the middle of January in Michigan, the air is so cold that a man's nostrils flap shut when he draws a deep breath. Every exhalation manifests itself as a cloud of steam. Hands chap and redden. Then. That day, the temperature tops out at 16 degrees. As the early winter chill seeps through the brick walls of Fisher Two, the hundred or so men inside realize the company needs to freeze them out. Fisher Two is situated on a rise just north of the Flint River. When the plant is running, a thousand workers produce 450 bodies a day, which are shipped to the assembly line at Chevy in the hole via viaduct that crosses Chevrolet Avenue. Since the beginning of the sit down, the strikers inside Fisher Two have spent most of their time time playing cards, singing union broadsides, and keeping fit with daily rooftop calisthenics. But some have been preparing for the confrontation General Motors now seems about to incite. Fred Ahern, who installs trunk boards, fashions a blackjack by loading a leather pouch with lead. Men unload car door hinges from storage kegs, lining them up on windowsill to employ as missiles against a potential assault by the bulls, plant guards, and police. To prevent a rear guard attack, they weld steel plates to the back doors and the doors leading to the overpass and roll auto body dollies against the vulnerable entrances. For the first two weeks of the strike, General Motors has provided heat to the strikers occupying the second floor of Fisher Two, and has allowed their wives to pass homemade ham, stews, bread, and pies through the windows. Gus's Cafe, a Greek diner with a big shop tray, donates meals. The plant guards inspect the care packages to ensure they contain no alcohol, then allow them to pass the gate. Pass the gate. Every evening at 6 o'clock, a union delegation delivers supper from the strike mess. The 11th of January is different. That evening, the usual contingent of eight company guards led by Pete Peterson, has been reinforced by a 20-man, two-man detachment armed with clubs and led by the chief of the Flint Fisher Body Plant Police. Around the same time, a contingent of Flint Police is gathering a few blocks south of the plant, blocking traffic on Chevrolet Avenue. First, the guards carry off a 24-foot ladder the strikers have been using to clamber in and out of a second-story window. Then when the food arrives, the guards bar the door. Not only is GM planning to freeze the strikers out, it's planning to starve them out, too. The company has been told by a Pinkerton spy who was part of the original occupation that there are only 100 men inside Fisher 2. It seems like an easier target than Fisher 1, whose striker population is two or three times greater. One of the sit-downers, Roscoe Rich, is standing at the front gate, a set of metal reinforced glass doors when the food delivery is blocked. He runs upstairs to report the blockade to strike leader Red Mundale, who's working in one of the administrative offices. Red, they stopped the food from coming in, Rich reports. Who the hell stopped the food from coming in, Mundale asks. Well, Pete Peterson, he locked the door, says Rich. Well, you go and tell Pete Peterson you want the keys to that door. Either he opens it or gives you the keys. If he don't give you the keys, Roscoe, you take your flying squad and you bust that damn door in. That's all there is to it. 
Just go down there and tell them you want the keys. Flying squads are paramilitary units ready to rush to trouble spots. Word of the blockade reaches strike headquarters at the Pengelly building shortly after 6 o'clock. Janora Johnson, she's the leader of the Women's Emergency Brigade, which is a, a women's uh, auxiliary designed to support the strikers. Uh, there were women working in uh, the plants when the strike started, but they were told to leave because uh, the strikers didn't want uh, GM to suggest there might have been anything going on between uh, men and women in the plants because that certainly would have uh, cut into support from home. Uh, so Janora Johnson is rehearsing a play there with her husband, Kermit, her sister, and two friends. Hearing that the strikers are being denied food and heat, they all drive over to Fisher 2. Outside the plants, Pickett singing Solidarity Forever, march in circles on the sidewalk, pausing to warm themselves at kerosene field salamanders. From a second story window, a man shouts, we're having a meeting and electing a committee to see about getting our meals through. The committee decides a method least likely to provoke a scrap with the guards is to pile food into picnic baskets and hoist it through the window on ropes. At 8.15, Victor Ruther arrives from the Pengelly building in a sound car, accompanied by his brother Roy and a United Rubber Workers organizer from Akron. By then, the police have barricaded Chevrolet Avenue, both north and south of the plant. But Victor is able to slip through the blockade via side street. Well, so they turned the heat off on you, Victor broadcasts through his loudspeaker. So they shut off your food. They have talked of avoiding violence. Now they have taken the first step. Victor has brought along a phonograph. He asks them if they want to hear some music. No, shouts a club-wielding striker leaning through the windows. We want action. Send a committee to the gate and tell those guards to open it up and turn on the heat, Ruther shouts back. With instructions from Red Mondale inside the plant and Victor Ruther outside, Roscoe Rich returns to the main gate with a 15-man flying squad, including Pete Pavlich, a brawler nicknamed Black Pete. They will break through the gate with brute force if the guards refuse to open it. Black Pete is prepared for this show now by wrapping stick solder around his hands. Rich confronts Peterson, who is standing inside the locked main entrance to the plant. From the street, Victor Ruther issues a decisive command. Take the gates! Now, either you open that door, Peter, I'm going to open it, Rich commands. I lost the keys, Peterson retorts. I'll give you three minutes, Rich replies. Rich begins counting down. When he reaches zero, the flying squad surges past the unresisting guards and busts the locks on the doors. The strikers rush outside and mingle with the pickets on the sidewalk while the overwhelmed plant police seek shelter in a women's restroom. From there, they radio the Flint Police Department to report they have been captured by the strikers. Minutes after the strikers break through the doors, two columns of Flint police officers begin crossing the bridge from their positions on the south bank of the river. They're armed with tear gas and wrapped in bulletproof vests. Their faces hidden inside World War tear gas masks with goggle eyes and rubber snouts. The officers look like a platoon of bipedal insects. Here they come, the pickets cry. Striker William Connolly is standing just inside the door. Gripping both ends of a blackjack, he is threaded through the handles. He braces his feet against the center post. Captain Edwin Hughes of the Flint police commands the strikers to open the gates. He gets no response. Above the front door is a window reinforced with chicken wire. A police officer smashes the glass with the butt of his tear gas gun. Not only thinks the weapon looks like a pistol, but he also thinks he ain't got guts enough to shoot a harmless worker. The cop does have guts. Firing a tear gas shell into the crowded lobby, the room where on ordinary work days employees punch in for their shifts. The flame from the discharge singes Connolly's cheeks and temporarily blinds him. He drops to the floor and begins crawling backward on his knees, seeking the safety of the shop floor. Meanwhile, a team of strikers has hooked up fire hoses. They kick open the door and direct the nozzles at the police who are still firing tear gas through the broken window. By God, thinks Mondale, we haven't got a lot to protect ourselves with, but if we can get those water hoses down, we will just wash them the hell out of here. Gas seeps in, water gushes out. The spray knocks several officers to the ground. Mondale notices a canister still discharging gas. He orders the men with the hose to sweep it out the door. Jesus, hit it with that water hose. Hit it with a water hose. From the open window on the, on the second floor, strikers pelt police with door hinges stockpiled for this moment. The tide of battle turns in the strikers' favor. The wind is blowing out of the north, wafting the tear gas back toward the police, who cannot advance into the cold, stinging spray from the hoses. Emboldened strikers surge out the front door and chase the retreating police toward the bridge, hurling any projectile they can lay their hands on. Hinges, bricks, nuts, bolts, milk bottles, shards of curbstone, even snowballs. The Stars and Stripes Forever blares from the sound car, a surreal patriotic soundtrack to the melee. The pickets join in the route, smashing police car windows and overturning a Genesee County Sheriff's Department cruiser, which contains Sheriff Walcott himself. It was bad enough they turned my car over, Walcott later remarks, but they did it with me in it. When he emerges from his upside-down vehicle, Walcott is struck in the head by a flying missile. He's one of nine law enforcement officers injured that night. 
Others are set upon and roughed up by pickets and strikers. Fred Ahern tears an ashtray out of a police car and uses it to crown a cop who's beating a fellow striker with a nightstick. Halfway through their retreat toward the bridge, the police turn and open fire into the pursuing mob. God damn, I got hit, Mundale hears a man cry. He turns to see blood running down Hans Larsen's leg, struck by buckshot from a police rifle. Police gunfire wounds 14 strikers and two pickets. Striker Robert Mamera is shot in the leg and the hip. Gig Mo takes a bullet to the shins. A young strike supporter who works for the streetcar company is hit twice in the belly. Nearly 3,000 spectators have gathered outside the plant, most of them sympathetic to the union. Ruth asks anyone with a car to park it on Chevrolet Avenue to block the police from resuming their attack. Go home and get your guns, Ruther beseeches through the sound car megaphone. Don't give up. Keep on fighting. We have reinforcements on the way from Toledo and Akron to help you fight these guys. Despite this call to arms, there are never guns inside the plants. UAW organizer Bob Travis doesn't want to give the cops another excuse to use violence. The wounded men are taken to a restaurant, then driven to Hurley Hospital in ambulances and private cars. Inside the plants, women press wet towels against the faces of tear gas men. The corporation is charged to sit downers with disregard for property, Bellas Ruther, who has become both field lieutenant and Greek chorus for the conflict. But it is General Motors who tonight that through the city police have destroyed property. All during these days, the Fisher Body workers have been sitting down peacefully, protecting their jobs. Yes, and religiously guarding the machines at which they earn their livelihood. Not a scratch has marred a single object in the plant until tonight when the police shot their gas and bullets into it in a cowardly attack upon these unarmed and peaceful men. What could they do but defend themselves as best they could? They must now fight not only for their jobs, but their very lives. Let General Motors be warned, however, the patience of these men is not inexhaustible. If there is further bloodshed here tonight, we will not be responsible for what the workers do in their rage. There are costly machines in that plant. Let the corporation and their thugs remember that. Janora Johnson, who is rushed over from the Pengelly building after hearing the strikers were being denied food, asked Ruther if she, too, can address the crowd from the sound car. He hands her the microphone. These men had no firearms, Johnson shouts. They were defenseless in the face of firearms. I ask all the women here tonight to come down and stand with your husbands and brothers. If the police are cowards enough to shoot down defenseless men, they're cowards enough to shoot down women. Women of the city of Flint, break through these police lines and come down here and stand with your husbands and your brothers, your sons and your sweethearts. In response to Johnson's exhortation, women surge toward the plant. As they pass through the police lines, one has their overcoat torn off by a cop, but the police don't stop the women, nor do they fire again once there's a danger of hitting one. Having been repulsed once and facing a hostile crowd, the police hold their position on the bridge only occasionally to save face, lobbing a gas bomb that illuminates the sky above the plant. The Flint police run out of gas shells at midnight. They appeal to Detroit for more, but are told that none can be spared. Sheriff Walcott himself halts an attempt to distribute rifles for a second attack. There's going to be no shooting here, he tells Chief Wills. I'm the leading law enforcement officer in the county during any troubles, and those are my orders. So they, they ch chased off the police. They held onto the plant. That's a wonderful and uh, vivid passage, uh, Ted, and I really enjoy that chapter. And I just want to uh, briefly note that um, if, uh, if, if any of you visit Flint, um, and you go down to Chevrolet Avenue, uh, you can park alongside the river. All the factories are gone and it's parkland now, um, but there's a historical marker where this happened, where there was this charge at the Fisher II, and uh, you can kind of almost like watch all of this play out. Um, and I, so well, some of the Fisher One, I mean, some of the building of Fisher One is still standing. Yes. Where the strike yeah, actually and, started. That's south of downtown on Saginaw Street. Yeah, and I, isn't the building across the street that was the union headquarters also still standing? I think, I it, I think it is. I mean, I don't know if there's anything in it, but I think th there is a building across the street that kind of fits the description of, you know, where they would go over for meetings and, and you know, where they announced that night that they this was the night that they were going to start the strike. Well, and one of the things that you talk about in the epilogue also was about the physical closing of uh, the Fisher One uh, in at the, what was it the end of the 80s, I, I think? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and and some of the union members thought that they were trying to get revenge for the sit down strike 50 years later. I think that was portrayed in Roger and Me, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah. Michael Moore's Michael Moore's crew was on hand? Yeah, yeah, because that came out in 89, and I think it was 87, you were thinking that, right. the, that the Fisher one closed in Buick City on the north side um, opened up. Um, 
Right. I mean, that's why they closed Fisher One because they transferred all the operations to Buick City. We're kind of getting into the inside baseball. Yeah, a little bit. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the Flint auto industry here. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I, I do think, though, that this is uh, an appropriate segue into the question of research, because um, obviously okay. you have to do a ton of research for this. And where do you start and where does it take you? Well, I think I started there uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s. Um, there was a uh, uh, U of M Flint, the, the Labor History Project. They conducted um, uh, oral histories with uh, uh, so, uh, more than 100 sit-down strikers. And then a lot of them are online. and But, uh, you know, a lot of them were just in... Um, you know, boxes and files uh, at the U of M Flint library. So I had to spend a lot of time. I spent two days just making copies uh, at, the, at the U of M Flint library and spending hundreds of dollars uh, for that. Um, so that was a big source of research. Uh, the Walter Ruther Library uh, in, at Wayne State University in Detroit, they have a big labor history uh, section um, and then they had, you know, they had files on some of the main characters in here, like the Ruther brothers, uh, Janora Johnson, Bob Travis, um, uh, you know, there's stuff by, about John L. Lewis in there. Uh, so that, that was another uh, big source of, of, uh, of research. So, and, and of course, you know, the, the original news reports from the, from the Flint journal. So. I did all my, and all my research in Flint and Detroit. I went to Ann Arbor once to look at the the papers of Frank Murphy, who was who was the governor at the time, and he's he's a real significant figure because uh, after the Battle of the Running Bulls, he sent the National Guard to Flint, and l legally he could have uh, you know expelled the strikers from the plant because they were technically trespassing, and because GM had a court injunction telling them that they had to leave, but he. Put the National Guard in the streets and just said, you know, keep the two sides apart. You know, I'm, I'm going to negotiate this. And, and he thought he had, he thought he had negotiated a settlement at, at Lansing, uh, at the state capitol, but that broke down. And then after that, the federal government got involved. Francis Perkins, all the way up to, to Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, and um, uh, Murphy. But Murphy oversaw the final negotiations in Detroit that finally settled the sit-down strike, and he was. He was defeated for re-election, I think, in part because of his handling of the sit-down strike. But he ended up as a attorney general and, and Supreme Court justice, so he did all right for himself. <laughs> but but the strikers, the strikers, I mean, the, they timed the strike for around his inauguration uh, because they, they they thought he would take their side. Uh, and to, the strike started on December 30th, and he was inaugurated on January 1st. Um, one of the other things that, that jumps out and, and, you know, Frank Murphy is actually a great example of this is, um, the amount of dialogue. In fact, I would say that in addition to, you know, your use of the present tense, uh, yeah. you know, having this, like the, the so much dialogue and having it be yeah. so, so animated was one of the things that really jumped out about this. Um, um, I'm thinking ever, anybody who reads this will remember the conversation that, uh, the phone conversation between uh, Secretary of, of uh, Labor. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll read that part. That's a great part. Oh, I, yeah. actually, I, 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 you know, um, I did a um, reading with uh, uh, Literati with, with Anna Clark and uh, uh, the Literati books. And she, we reacted out. She played Perkins <laughs> and I played uh, Sloan. And, uh, but this is, this is when, um, she thinks she has an agreement with, with Sloan. She thinks Sloan has agreed to put a proposal to the workers, and he calls her. He calls her up, and, and he, this is what happens when he goes back on his word. Okay, so uh, that evening, as Perkins is dining with her daughter and her friend in her DC apartment, the telephone rings. The maid answers and interrupts family dinner. Miss Perkins, a gentleman wants to speak to you. He says it's very important. Did he say who he is? He says his name is Mr. Sloan from New York. Perkins takes the call. She is enraged by what Sloan tells her. 
Uh, I don't think these men are in good faith, he says of the union's leadership. I, I think they got a crook in the organization. I'm not going to do anything of the sort with these with the men. You know, Sloan has this great Brooklyn accent. You know, he's even though he's this titan of industry, he sounds like one of the Bowery boys. Mr. Sloan, you gave your word. You gave your word in front of witnesses. For bile rising, Perkins begins shouting insults that are entirely out of character for a well-bred, well-educated New England woman. Only once before in her life has she been so angry. You were a scoundrel and a skunk, Mr. Sloan. You can't do that kind of thing. That is a rotter. That is a quitter. You have deceived people. You have misled people. Perkins' daughter, Susanna, has never heard her mother speak to anyone with such invective. The secretary continues tearing into Sloan. You don't deserve to be counted among decent men, she roars. Decent people don't do such things. You'll go to hell when you die if you do things like that. You have let down people. You have betrayed your government. You have betrayed the men who work for you, betrayed your stockholders. Are you a grown man, Mr. Sloan, or are you a neurotic adolescent? If you were a grown man, stand up and be a man for once. Perkins would be out of line speaking to any U.S. citizen this way, much less one of the principles in the strike she's trying to settle. Sloan is justifiably outraged by her tirade, but her wounded dignity produces a response that doesn't make him look much better than his antagonist. You can't talk to me like that, he shouts back when he is finally able to edge in a few words, edge a few words into Perkins raving. You can't talk to me like that. I'm Alfred Sloan. I've got 70 million and I made it all myself. You can't talk to me like that. Haven't you ever read what happens to the rich man, Perkins scolds? It's like the camel trying to go through the eye of the needle. If you've got $70 million, it's going to drown you, Mr. Sloan. It's going to sink you. For God's sake, don't say those words to me again. It makes you a worse rotter than I thought you were. And of course, Sloan now, uh, you know, he never put his name on a car like Henry Ford or Walter Chrysler, uh, but he put his name on a hospital. So I, I think people know his name uh, through the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. And Kettering was another GM executive, uh, Charles, Charles Kettering. So he used some of his 70 million for uh, philanthropy. So what is... And that came from... Uh, that came from an oral history that Francis Perkins gave to Columbia University. And, and I did, I actually did go to Columbia University once to look at the Francis Perkins papers. Is it a different process, like finding, finding dialogue, finding transcriptions of that sort of thing than it, or is it just sort of like turn up along with the other research yeah, that you're doing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, anytime I found dialogue and, I, I tried to use it because, I, like you said, I wanted to make it read like a story. You know, I, there, was some, there was some that was in memoirs. There was a memoir called The Many and the Few by Henry Krauss, and he was sort of this, he was this left-wing labor pamphleteer who showed up in Flint and started a newspaper called The Flint Auto Worker, and there was a book called Organized by, by Wyndham Mortimer, and he was the guy who originally uh, tried to organize uh, Flint from the he was the first organizer they sent up to Flint and he would hold these secret surreptitious meetings in, you know, people's basements or in their houses or you know, he, he, you know, got these African-American workers, you know, like a, a dozen of them in a, in a church at midnight. So, I mean, there, you know, and, and, you know, he checked into this, he, he checks into this cheap hotel and they're, they're a GM, uh, uh, spies waiting in the lobby reading newspapers so you know it's some of this was you know some of this to me like was was one of these you know proletarian novels from the 30s i actually just reread uh in dubious battle by john updike that's his strike novel and then some of it is is kind of like a noir, a noir story like raymond chandler or, or cornell woolrich so i i think in in writing it i was some i think i was inspired by literature of the 30s since that's the era that's a decade where, where all this comes from. I can see um, the Raymond Chandler, especially in the early sections with, um, with, with Wyndham Mortimer, uh, you know, which is one of the very first right. things in the book, but he, <laughs> he shows up and it just, it's like people have got it out for him from the moment he, uh, right. he arrives in town. Um, I just want to remind any of our guests, if you have any questions for Ted about his book, um, go ahead and, you know, add them to the chat and, uh, in just a few minutes here, I imagine we'll be able to uh, to take those. Um, uh, Ted, I just had a had, had a couple more questions for you, if you like. Okay. Um, uh, one thing which which I'm always curious about with any any piece of uh, historical fiction is what is something that surprised you in the course of researching and writing this book? 
Uh, I guess probably that, you know, like you said, there was so much dialogue and there were so many, you know, personal reminiscences uh, of strikers. You know, I think, I don't, you know, you, you mentioned Sidney Fine's book. I think one thing that I had, well, he, he was able actually to interview living strikers, which I couldn't do, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that I had all these oral histories to, to draw from, uh, you know, I think really added a lot of um, color to the book. So that's, I think that's one thing that kind of really surprised me and, and pleased me throughout the research. And um, I'm also always curious, what is, um, what's your favorite part of the book? There are a lot of good um, ones. From. <laughs> Probably the two I just read, uh, the, the <laughs> account of the Battle of the Running Bulls and and the and uh, um, that one, and then uh, and well, I guess the 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 you know we were we were talking about um, uh, Wyndham Wyndham Mortimer, and I guess I could uh, I, I could read about I could just read a little bit about his arrival uh, in. Uh, in Flint, let me see if I can uh, find that part. That's um, that sweltering summer, uh, a labor organizer appears in Flint. On the morning of June 20th, Mortimer parks his car in front of the green awning of the Hotel Dresden, a red brick building with six tiers of cheap rooms at the corner of South Saginaw and 3rd. Mindful that the UAW's treasury contains only $25,000, he asked the desk clerk for the simplest lodgings available, a bachelor's room costing $12 a week. Signing his name in the register beneath the date, June 20th, he is handed a key from the rack behind the desk and follows the bellboy upstairs, where he opens the door to a bed, a sink, a pair of windows darkened by rolled down shades. As, Mortimer, as soon as Mortimer shrugs off his suit jacket, the telephone on the nightstand rings. You'd better get the hell back where you came from if you don't want to be carried out in a box of voice threads. Who's this, Mortimer demands, the silence on the other end. How would you like to go to hell, says Mortimer, banging the receiver down onto its cradle. The next morning, Mortimer walks through the hotel lobby on his way to make a first tour of the vehicle city. A man sitting in an armchair spots a new organizer, folds his copy of the Flint Journal, and follows Mortimer out the door. From now on, wherever he goes in Flint, Mortimer finds a car full of men observing his movements. Pickerton detectives, maybe. The Pinks had a history of breaking strikes, so going all the way back to Homestead in 1892. The Flint Common Council, which not surprisingly is under the influence of General Motors, has passed a number of ordinances intended to thwart union organizing efforts such as Mortimer's. It is illegal to hand out literature on the street. It is illegal to use an amplifier to broadcast a messenger speech. To organize Flint, a town that was so completely dominated by the General Motors Corporation, would not be easy, he writes in his memoir, Organize. An indescribable cloud of fear hung over the city. And it was next to impossible to find anyone who would discuss the union or who would be seen in my company, much less help in building one. I concluded that if Flint was to be organized, it would have to be done quietly, without publicity, and mostly at night. I, I think, let's see. So I, I think I had a... Uh, a passage where uh, he would drive out of town and he would go to a movie, go into a movie, and then he would just kind of he would just walk out the back door and drive back into town because he was he was trying to keep the keep the company spies off his track. Okay, you can come back now, Connor. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that um, and, and maybe that's the passage that I thought of when you uh when you mentioned Raymond Chandler. Is it sounds mm -hmm. like something that would, would happen in, um, you know, for right. all my life here, something like that. Um, right. uh, one, of, one of the other characters that, that I had not known much about prior uh, to, to reading um, this was uh, Janora Johnson. And uh, right. just, you know, the amount of space and attention you give to the emergency women's brigade and their role in it. Um, just earlier today, I heard somebody, you know, I think it was on Facebook say that, you know, she should be the subject of a movie. Right. And, or at least his impression of her after reading reading your book. Um, do you want to talk for a moment about the uh, Women's Brigade? Yeah, well, they, um, uh, you know, there's an event every year in Flint called White Shirt Day. And it's on the anniversary of the 
February, on February 11th, the anniversary of the sit-down strike, and I went to last year's, and I'm sure there's not going to be one this year because of the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, they have women wearing red berets and red armbands and serving bean soup and apples and bread, which is what the strikers ate. And that's what, that, that's what the, you know, the Women's Emergency uh, Brigade um, wore. I mean, Janora Johnson had been involved in socialist causes uh, even before the strike. And, you know, when it, when it broke out, she decided to, you know, organize the women into this, you know, paramilitary force to support the, the strikers, you know, since they, women couldn't actually participate in the strike and they couldn't be in the plants. And, you know, they, they would carry around, you know, bars of soap and socks and they would, uh, you know, whittle down clubs to fit their hands. And, and when, uh, um, the strikers took over, uh, Chevy four, uh, you know, in the, the company was tear gassing them. Uh, the women's emergency brigade broke the windows so that the tear gas could escape. They and that's on the cover. Of the, the cover of the book you can see all these broken windows, and they broke them with their with their clubs so the tear gas uh, could escape. And and as I mentioned in the Battle of the Running Bulls, they kind of interposed themselves between the police uh, and the plant because they said, "Well, the police aren't going to shoot, aren't going aren't to shoot women," so they use their kind of femininity that way. Um, and there's a movie, there's a which you can watch on YouTube. There's a documentary about the women's emergency brigade called "With Babies and Banners." It's about 45 minutes long. And Janora Johnson, who would remarried by then, her name was Janora Dollinger, is uh, main char- is the main character. And you can see how kind of uh, what a formidable leader she was, because for the rest of her life she was still kind of uh, living off this identity as as having participated in the sit down strike and, and speaking it speaking at union rallies. Yeah, those are, those are some of the most, uh, you know, stirring passages, I would say. Um, and, uh, just, I, I want to also thank, uh, everybody who's commented so far. We've got some nice comments from, uh, Judy and from Barbara. And again, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask Ted, uh, go ahead and put that there. Um, I suppose just one, one last question. Um, okay. and, and I, I think it's probably got some, uh, some universality to it, but, um, you know, uh, looking back on this, it seems like this, this glorious, uh, you know, universally celebrated event, um, uh, at the time the city was not in the, the municipal government was not really in the strikers corner, uh, right. as you bring back over and over again, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of the city and the police and the sheriff's department were very much acting on general motors behalf. What is the, uh, tension, you think, um, and, and not just in the sit-down strike, but in conflicts between labor and business as well, to keep local governments uh, truly impartial? Um, the tension to keep local governments truly impartial. I, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, I, I think that Murphy was certainly, you know, trying to do that. I mean, I think that at one point he talked um, the local uh, um, district attorney out of you know, putting sort of a blanket charge on a lot of uh, a lot of the strikers, um, and uh, you know the the they, they, I think the strikers were trying to the judge who would issue the first injunction to get them out of the plant. He was a GM stockholder, so uh, the the strikers were were trying to get the the state legislature to to impeach him, um, and you know they said he had, they said he had a conflict. Uh, of interest, but uh, you know the, the I think that the it, it became too big of a thing to simply, um, especially after the you know I you know, mentioned the, the when the Flint police tried to take over Fisher too after Battle of the Running Bulls, it, it it kind of quickly became a much bigger thing than Flint, and it was taken out of the hands of the local authorities. That's that's when that's when Murphy stepped in, and ultimately the mm-hmm. the federal government stepped in. I mean, it was it was a nationwide um, crisis because you know they had take first they had taken over a, a body plant that with dyes that stamped out bodies from cars that were built all over the country, and then they took over the engine plant and they built engines for cars all over the country, and uh, GM just couldn't build cars at all, uh, you know, and it was it was imperiling the nation's economic uh, recovery. So obviously, you know, Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted to wanted to step in and. and See it settled. All right, we um we do have a question from Jan, uh, and she asked, "Does Flint carry the ghosts of the sit-down strike 
in any way that you detected in your research? And if so, are they benign or what else? Uh, well, you can probably answer that one too. I mean, I think Anna Clark had a, a good comment about how it, it, uh, it uh, sort of started a, a spirit of activism that has gone on in Flint throughout the generations. You know, you, you, in the, in the 60s when Flint was the first town to, you know, pass an open housing law, mm -hmm. or did they pass it or did they just refuse to, or did they just reject uh, somebody it, trying to put it down? It was like a five-step process, but basically, right. uh, yeah, they, uh, the city voted not to overturn the yeah. open ordinance that the city council had passed under okay. Durham. All right, all right, but well, that's still that's an endorsement of open housing. Yeah, and you know, so there, you know, there's obviously you know the the labor the, the labor activism was, you know, very strong. I mean, being from Lansing, I would always hear uh, Lansing auto workers say that Flint auto workers were more were more militant uh, than any anybody else. Uh, and then you know, then there's the activism now we see among uh, you know around the water crisis. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think you know Flint has a long history of. Uh, of, of fighting battles and it's still going on to this day. So Good answer. Be, 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 a, be a proud Flintstone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, telling this story uh, with such sure. energy and, and poise. Um, uh, also, uh, oh, Majors and Quinn is just saying, uh, well, I'll hand it back to, uh, to Annie. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, you're great. I just wanted to come back on and uh, remind everyone that they can get a copy of Midnight and Vehicle sure. City from the Majors and Quinn website. It's www.majorsandquinn.com. Um, and I did put a link to it in there. And our copies do have uh, signed book plates signed by Ted. So if you order from us, you will get a signed one. Thanks so much, Ted. Thank and you. thank you, uh, Connor, for those wonderful questions and everyone for watching. Um, any any final thoughts on the way out here tonight? Um, I don't. Do we have any time left, or are we are we done? We have time. Yeah, we've got time. I, I could read about how the strike ended. I could finish up that way. Yeah. Read about okay. the read about the victory celebration. All right. Perfect. Okay. Here it is. In Flint, the city's biggest celebration since Armistice Day is about to break out. One newspaper compares it to Mardi Gras, which took place in New Orleans just two days earlier. Mortimer drives straight from Detroit to Fisher One, where he reads the settlement to the strikers, who vote unanimously to accept it. All day long, as the National Guard withdraws its barricade outside Fisher One, unionists who weren't part of the sit-down, but hope to participate in the evacuation march, have been trying to climb into the plant through the windows. Finally, the latecomers are told, if you weren't willing to sit in with us, you can't come out to, in to walk out with us. Shortly after 5 o'clock, a half dozen bearded strikers, part of an unshaven crew who have dubbed themselves the Beaver Boys of Flint, walk out the front gate wearing bedding, clothes, an amplifier, and a heater. They drop it all off at strike headquarters across the street, then return to the plant with a delegation from the Women's Emergency Brigade who have donned red and green berets. Up on the rooftop, a dozen men on a a banner declaring victory is ours. Now that the guardsmen are gone, the Union sound car is driven through the North Gate past hundreds of supporters gathered on both sides of the driveway. Today is an exciting day, Homer Martin declares over the sound car's loudspeaker. This evacuation marks the beginning of an era of better wages and better working conditions for workers. General Motors has at last recognized the rights of workers. We look forward to a great United Automobile Workers Union. You have fought a great fight and the ends justified the means. The world pays you tribute. When the strikers leave Chevy for the man at the head of the column carrying an American flag is Roscoe Van Zant, an African-American sanitation worker who was trapped in the plant during the takeover, then invited to join the occupation. Uh, his fellow sit-downers have voted to make him flag bearer. At 5.42 p.m., Fisher One's factory whistle blows, signaling the end of the Flint sit-down strike, a 44-day shift. 400 men walk out of the plant and into the winter dusk behind uh, the Stars and Stripes. They lead the march to the Pengelly building for a celebratory rally. Showered with confetti and streamers, the strikers shout, Yay, Fisher, and what a day, what a day, we have won a great victory, before breaking into a rendition of Hail, Hail, the gang's all here. That can barely be heard over the honking of hundreds of cars jamming Saginaw Street. Is there a question about who won the strike but a voice from the sound car? No. The crowd, which has grown in thousands, sings a verse of how solidarity forever. Husbands seek out wives for their first kiss after only weeks apart. The mother hands an infant to the baby's long absent father. Brothers and sisters, this is a historic occasion, Bob Travis announces from the sound car. I want to congratulate the boys who were inside. 17 plants have been recognized by General Motors 
due to those boys, 2,000 strong, carrying bundles of clothing in one hand and tiny flags in the other. The marchers streamed north on Saginaw Street behind a flag bearer, two drummers, and a drum major, a patriotic vanguard resembling Archibald Willard's painting, The Spirit of 76. Uh, right behind them, litter bearers carry a stretcher bearing an effigy of George Boyson, the president of the Flint Alliance. This was the pro company <laughs> group whose role in prolonging the strike uh, has not been forgotten. As the marchers depart, GM plant police move in and bar the gates, exchanging civil war farewells with the strikers uh, and even hurrying after them to return a bundle of clothing left behind in the watchman shanty. When Travis arrives at Fisher, he meets with National Guard officers and persuades them to withdraw their troops across the Chevrolet Avenue bridge to allow a crowd waiting in front of Chevy Ford to reach the plant. The guardsmen walk away to the shouts of attaboy soldiers from men in second story windows. The strikers file out the front door behind a guitarist plucking hillbilly tunes. When the Chevy Four crowd appears, it chants, Yay, Chevy! Yay, Chevy! Fight, fight, fight! Followed by Yay, Fisher! And then Yay, Murphy, in honor of the governor. The strikers fire flares into the deepening darkness, illuminating the march for newspaper photographers and newsreel cameramen. Hundreds of strikers sporting union buttons march four abreast up Chevrolet Avenue, then Third Avenue, then Saginaw Street, where they halt to dump the Boyson effigy into the Flint River. Uh, the march ends at the Pengelly building, where the victorious strikers jam inside to watch the strike marches on, a play put on by the ladies' auxiliary. They also break the temperance pledge they swore for the strike's duration. The celebration drags on into the wee hours of Friday morning when tipsy couples drag themselves across the dance floor to the flagging strains of a weary band, every one of them drunk on booze and triumph. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone says Francis Perkins. Actually, Francis Perkins is from Massachusetts, but she did live in Maine <laughs> in, in her retirement. Maine has claimed her. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, that was a great way to end it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Connor. Again, it was great to meet you. Thanks, Connor. Thank you. And yeah. have a wonderful evening, everyone who tuned in. Right. Thank you much. If you uh, know of anyone who wasn't able to watch live this evening, just know that the videos will remain on the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel so they can check them out anytime. All right. Okay. All right. See you in Flint after the pandemic, Connor. <laughs> Stay warm. Okay.